The exhibit hall is open and the conference is in full swing. It's another packed day here at the MRS 2022 fall meeting. And we're back again in Boston with another exciting installment of MRS TV. I'm your host, Katie Brace. We've got another great episode today that you do not want to miss. If you're interested in how scientists can work to shape policy, you've got to tune in as we chat with Glenn Reskin and Lucas Zakalakos about the MRS Government Affairs and Congressional Fellowship Program. Brush up on your communication skills with the interactive improv for science communication session. Then hear from Ashley White about her career and experience as a woman in materials science. Later, we'll explore more domestic research as well as exciting innovations out of Hong Kong and Taiwan. First, though, we'll catch a quick glimpse of yesterday's IMATSAI Speed Pitches event. We're here for IMATSAI, which is a speed pitch for uh, earlier phase material sciences companies like ourselves. And so what we do is we have a nanomaterial that we industrially manufacture in large factories the size of basically this entire city block. Our company has taken a 21st century nano uh, coating technology and we take 19th century paper to outperform 20th century plastic. Plastic was, a, was this miracle material, but how do we replace that? And obviously plastic's a big problem. So paper is nice and biodegradable and we're using the kind of 21st century materials of the Materials Research uh, Society to say, okay, we can upgrade that. Well, this is a pretty cool event for us to be able to reach out and talk to potential investors, industrial partners for an early stage startup like us. It's a pretty great way to get exposure. I'm with Guardian Technologies and what we're developing is a new type of charge detector that essentially eliminates vacuum and high voltage systems that are critical for analytical instruments from residual gas analyzers to mass spectrometers to even some surface science equipment. We are commercializing an optical polymer technology that uh, is for 3D imaging and well, what we do is make a wide field of view scalable optics um, for, for the 3D imaging market. We're here to network. Uh, we've been, we were here in 2019 before COVID and the other companies that come here are absolutely fabulous. A lot of the investors, a lot of the big companies that come here, um, really solid community, really great people taking real world materials. And then unlike your typical startup, which is very software and actually doesn't have much technology, you have a bunch of PhD commercial people here who really know their stuff. I mean, the people from Dow, Hank Cole, places like that, they have PhDs, they've got 20 years of commercial experience, and they know what they're doing and how to take technologies from the bench, and they know what it looks like to do at an industrial scale and to commercialize that nationally. We're looking to raise a round in 2023, so our first contact with investors would be an amazing thing. Uh, we're also hiring, so trying to identify a couple engineers to bring on board would be really nice as well. Given the access to uh, angels in the chemical industry, that's a, pr that's a perfect fit for what we're doing because we are a materials-based company and this, these are the right investors. At the Shenzhen Institute, the Materials Synthetic Biology Center is the first ever international center focusing on research at the nexus of material science and synthetic biology. They're applying their innovative research, both fundamentally and translationally. We strive to build up an international renowned first class research hub where our technology, innovation, and education of the next generation scientists are closely integrated and across disciplinary collaborations are particularly encouraged. Our lab invented technology that allows to speed up evolution of gene of interest towards certain desired phenotypic outcome. We program biomaterials by incorporating protein coding gene sequences into polymeric metrics to modulate the cellular microenvironment. So we believe definitely that we are lead a future trends in a wider spread of applications in medicine, energy, and other fields in the future.
Joining me now are Lucas Zagalakos and Glenn Ruskin. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. First off, tell us about the role of the MRS Government Affairs Committee. So government affairs is about advocating for science, policy, and funding, right? So a big part of our society does research and that takes funding, right? And uh, so we advocate on behalf of the society, the members, to uh, ensure that there's adequate research funding that's coming in, primarily U.S. focused, but more broadly for the, the society as well. So what are some of the programs that are in place to support that? So, uh, yeah, uh, building on, uh, on what Lucas said, there's uh, two uh, working groups uh, that are part of the Government Affairs Committee. One is public outreach, the other is grassroots advocacy. Public outreach connects MRS leadership and the board members with members of Congress through a Congressional Visits Day. They also do federal agency funding uh, sessions, and they also host a federal agency summit. Here at this meeting at the Materials Voice kiosk in the exhibit hall, members will have a chance to contact their U.S. Senators and House members advocating for full funding for a very important piece of legislation, the CHIPS and Science Act, which would be historic levels of funding. So I hope as members uh, watch this video that they'll take the time to go to that kiosk and contact their elected officials. How important is it that the elected officials hear directly from folks in the material science world? When you look at the 535 members of Congress and the Senate and the House, there's a handful that have any type of scientific background. So it's critical that they hear from their constituents involved in that area uh, so that they can make good decisions on legislation before them. So we've been talking about the United States, MRS is international. Yes. Is there an international component at all for helping folks who are not in the United States of America? There are programs that the US government funds that actually fund researchers in other mm -hmm. parts of the world for collaborative international Excellent. research. So we advocate on, on that issue. About yes. half of the society is outside the right. US. Help them as they engage in their local communities. How do we help them and give them materials so that they can advocate on, on, uh, on their behalf? Nice. And to pivot a little bit, the Society co-sponsors a Congressional Fellowship with Optica. Can you both tell us a little bit more about the Congressional Fellows Program? Sure. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity for an MRS member to work on Capitol Hill for a period of one year. And they get involved with drafting legislation, helping conduct hearings, writing speeches, engaging with a variety of stakeholders. It's really a once in a lifetime opportunity to engage with policymakers and give them that scientific expertise they so desperately need. And this might be out of the box for a lot of people who are research based, but if they want to get involved in the MRS Government Affairs Committee, what should they do? There is a way to directly reach out through the MRS website and, and post their, their interest in, in joining the committee, but they can also reach out to either of us. We are always uh, looking to add to the committee and, and grow the committee and build a strong, diverse uh, membership in the committee that, that can help us in, in advocacy. All right, Lucas and Glenn with the MRS Governmental Affairs Committee. We thank you both for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Now, if you've ever wondered how to better share your scientific ideas, improv comedy might not be the first thing you'd think to try. But Anne Lynn Jillian Daniel is going to show us how it can be the perfect tool to bolster your communication skills. I think presentation skills are crucial, and I think particularly in a society like the Material Research Society, where there's so many multi multiple disciplines coming together, people working on these very multidisciplinary projects with people who are different fields, different areas, you have to be able to communicate your work and you have to be able to understand other people. So the better your communication skills, the more diversity of people you're gonna be able to work with. For people who aren't familiar with it, improvisation is this idea that you have two or more people who are gonna tell a story in real time. So they don't have any props, they don't have a script, they really have no idea what's gonna happen. And so practicing the skills of being able to do that helps you respond quickly in real time. Students often talk about being able to think on their feet. Um, you're more creative, so, and you also have this idea of positive communication, which is a very fundamental part of improvisation. So this workshop is an adaptation of a class that I lead for graduate students in STEM at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. We'll start with a little bit of a warm up to get people used to the space. It's a very interactive workshop. I wanna get used to, people used to talking out loud, used to me, used to each other. 
Um, and then we move into one of the fundamental parts of improv, which is this idea of positive communication. We'll practice that in an activity. And then we'll spend the last half of the workshop having um, the attendees work in small groups to develop an elevator pitch, which is designed to be a short description of their research that sparks additional conversation that they can use throughout the meeting. Uh, a success story I can tell you from my class, uh, I had a student in my class who gave a talk for an entrepreneurial conference. And so he went in front of this group. It was the largest audience he'd ever spoken in front of. It was like 300 people. And as he went to start his presentation, his slides cut out, they stopped working. And one of the tenets of improv is being creative and be able to be spontaneous and adjust to the moment. And he was able to do that, he told me, because he had taken um, the class and he thought about improvisation as he was doing his talk. So he was able to relax and, and then give a very excellent talk. And he received funding too. Probably not due to the improv, but because um, his idea was amazing. <laughs> but I was glad he was able to do that. In Taiwan's own Silicon Valley National Kai University's Semiconductor Innovation Ecosystem boasts an outstanding track record in frontier and applied semiconductor research and talent development. This powerhouse research center is driven by its mantra, together we go far. NYCU Semiconductor Ecosystem. This ecosystem is a vibrant and thriving ecosystem for semiconductor innovation. ICST is the platform for international collaboration and IAIS is the platform for industry, academia, co-innovation and co-creation. ICST our goal is to become a semiconductor research and education hub. TSI is one of the eight national applied research laboratories in Taiwan, focusing on the cutting edge academic research in semiconductors. We connect, we collaborate, we innovate, and we co create to foster cross domain research and talent development. Let's go now to Glyco MIP, a nationwide collaboratory where members of the materials research community share tools, samples, data, software, and know-how for the collective advancement of Glyco materials science and technology. The strategic development of new Glyco materials poses several challenges, and that's why the National Science Foundation funded Glycomap a materials innovation platform that focuses on the development of new glycomaterials. You can't develop new glycomaterials with existing methodologies, not in a rational way. You have to innovate both in the way you synthesize them, the way you characterize them, and the way you apply theory to predict them. And this is the sort of thing that requires the scientific ecosystem and the interplay between disciplines that's offered within a MIP. So glycomaterials have been made by nature for millions of years. Nature knows how to synthesize them and knows how to degrade them. So what Glycomip is attempting to do and what makes me most excited is to think about ways to use what nature has already given us and apply that to use for products of everyday use. We work to optimize a, li a liquid hydrogel, so it's it's reverse thermoresponsive, which means it's liquid at cold temperatures and solid at higher temperatures. And this is used to treat brain aneurysm, so we would inject it through a microcatheter up through the carotid artery and fill the sac-like dilation. I work on research on uh, perovskite solar cells, which is a very, very relevant field right now. Um, perovskite solar cells have exploded in efficiency over the last decade from, you know, uh, very unstable and uh, very low efficiencies to uh, 
almost competing with silicon at this point. Uh, as we run out, run out of oil and as uh, climate change gets worse, it's going to get more and more applicable for us to generate power using green sources. Uh, solar cells is going to be one of the, it already is uh, one of the most viable renewable energy technologies and it's only going to continue to be so. I'm studying mixture of liquid and uh, solid and also interface interaction and this is kind of phenomenon we, we can face in everyday life. For example, in um, water purifying and also in battery we use in our cell, uh, our cell phone and uh, also I think there is many applications. In 2021, MRS Bulletin launched MRS Bulletin Impact, a premier outlet for high-impact original materials research. Original research articles feature hot topics, innovative work, and foundational contributions. Learn more about submitting a manuscript at mrs.org slash bulletin impact. Thank you to our 2022 MRS Fall Meeting Gold, Silver, and Bronze Level Symposium supporters. Your support of a symposium session helps symposium organizers provide a high-quality technical program and encourages participation from researchers from around the world. Visit the MRS website to learn more about the MRS Symposium Support Program and how you can share in the Society's commitment to the advancement of scientific research. MRS Presents hosts live webinars and workshops throughout the year, providing engaging, educational information on cutting-edge topics in materials research as well as a variety of career development and diversity and equity events. Join us for our next online event by visiting mrs.org slash mrspresents. Just think of the impact 10,000 letters could make. Take a few minutes to send convenient, personalized letters to your representatives on Capitol Hill and let your voice be heard. Visit the Materials Voice booth in the Exhibit Hall on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Supporting the Society's core value of being inclusive and egalitarian and furthering the MRS diversity, equity, and inclusion aspiration MRS's corporate partner program focuses on advancing these values within the profession and within the society. We thank these corporate partners for joining us in diversifying materials. In our last segment for today, we're joined by Ashley White, Interim Deputy for Strategy Division Office and Director of Communications at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, as she speaks about her career and the obstacles that women face in science and engineering. So I spent a lot of the first portion of my career in the research lab, and one of the things that I realized as I was finishing up my graduate studies and going into a postdoc is that I really liked looking at the bigger picture of things. What was the impact my research was having, or how could I think longer term about research directions? I happened to find out from a colleague about the opportunity to apply for a Congressional Science and Engineering Fellowship through the Materials Research Society and Optica, and that is an experience 
experience where a scientist can go and give policy advice on Capitol Hill. So I had the opportunity to go and work in Congress for a year, and it really gave me the opportunity to see what was beyond the research lab. And even though I didn't stay in Congress longer term, it set me on a path to do something a little more oriented towards the bigger picture. And it's the career path that I think was ultimately the right choice for me. In addition to having a congressional fellowship, I had the opportunity to work at the National Science Foundation, I worked at a nonprofit um, before I ended up at Berkeley Lab. And I think along the way, there were a lot of different pivots and career decisions I had to make. I had a long-term goal originally of being a professor, and I think learning along the way what different options were outside of staying in academia was really important. My role at Berkeley Lab today allowed me to combine a lot of things, my materials research background, my experience with public policy, with communications, and the bigger picture, and I can combine all of those things in the roles that I have today. Diversity, equity, and inclusion in material science is a really important topic. One of the things that I talked about in my talk today was how important it is that we focus on workplace culture. We can go to a lot of effort to recruit more diverse people into our organization, but if we're not welcoming and inclusive of different people, backgrounds, and ideas once they get there, then we're really just going to lose people out of the pipeline. One of the things that I work on at Berkeley Lab as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts is workplace culture. So we talk about work-life balance, we talk about psychological safety, feeling comfortable to bring up new ideas in our work environment and meetings. We talk about microaggressions and how to be an upstander to step in when someone might have inadvertently talked over someone or given credit to not the original person who brought up an idea. While some of these things seem small, I think that they are incremental, they are building up over time, and I think making these small improvements are really part of the bigger picture to making sure that we have an inclusive workplace that is welcoming of diversity. One of the things that's been really important to me in my career, especially the last 10 years, has been to be involved with MRS as a volunteer. When I first finished my Congressional Fellowship, I joined the Government Affairs Committee. I later got involved in our sustainability efforts and have chaired the Focus on Sustainability subcommittee for the last six years. For me, it was important to give back to the society, especially after they sponsored the Congressional Fellowship that really changed the path of my career. And it's really been an opportunity for me as well to get to try out leadership skills in a different environment than my day job. Um, I can try out new things, new ways of leading, new ideas, and it's a safe environment. Being in a role that is outside the research lab, I love being able to come to the MRS meeting every year and interact with the material scientists, and it really feels like home. Thanks so much for joining us, Ashley. That's it for today's show, but stay tuned for more to come tomorrow. You can keep watching MRS TV on screens around the Hines and Sheridan. On the MRS website. In select hotels. And on YouTube and Twitter. Join us again tomorrow for our final episode of this year's fall meeting. We'll talk to Samuel Stoop, this year's recipient of the prestigious Von Hippel Award. Learn about the MRS's special interest groups and much, much more. I'm Katie Brace, and I'll see you then.